Good morning, everybody. Good morning. If you're out in the foyer, feel free to come on in, and we'll, we'll start our service this morning. So good morning, everybody. So good morning, and welcome to our morning service at Crescent Church. Um, if you're a visitor, you're especially welcome. Uh, our speaker this morning is Professor Danny Crooks. He's going to be continuing our series in 1 John, and his topic is Testing the Spirits. Uh, and we're also starting our summer kids program this morning, called, uh, Crescent Kids. So this is for children of primary school age, uh, and the, the kids will be with us for the first part of the service, and then when we're singing our second song, they're going to move into the minor hall. Uh, but to start our service this morning, we're actually going to kick off with a kids song, and it's a kids song, More Than Conquer. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel and Amy, who are going to help us with some helpers. Rachel and Amy there and their helpers for giving us off to a really energetic start this morning. That's great. Uh, let's open our service in prayer. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you that once again we can meet here together in your presence. And we pray for Danny as he opens your word to us. And, and we pray that you will open our hearts to the message that you want to give us this morning, that we can take it on board and, and live it through our lives. Lord, we especially thank you for all of the events of Community Week this week. We thank you for the connections made, the opportunities to present your gospel, and we pray that as a church that we can build on the work of this week and continue to lift up your name in this church and in the surrounding area. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And just as I mentioned in the prayer there, it was Community Week this week, so I'm gonna have, we're going to have a little update from Robert Abraham, who I'm just frantically looking for. Oh, he's in the back there. That's great. <laughs> so we are going to have an update from Rab just about all the activities and things that have been happening across Community Week. Thank you. Sorry to give you the frighteners there. Um, so we really want to thank um, every individual who helped this week as part of our Community Week. There will be uh, pictures uh, shown behind me just giving you some um, idea of some of the things that went on through the week. They, they are not in sequence to the way I am actually sharing with you, so um, don't be expecting my, uh, me to be in tune with the pictures. Um, uh, so uh, it's really truly been a, a wonderful week, um, and we want to thank, um, as I say, everybody who helped out in, in any capacity. Um, we also want to thank the church for their support and prayer and financially. Um, through the week. We had over a hundred members and associates involved in helping in some capacity, which is really amazing. And uh, I think that's a first um, for that number of people to be involved through the week. 
Um, we had a great turnout on Friday night, so I'm starting at the, at the end of the week for our party in the car park. Um, we know that over 290, 99 ice creams were consumed, uh, and everybody was only get to get one each, so we reckon there were over 300 uh, people with us, probably more than that, because I didn't get an ice cream accident. There were 70 or 80 uh, children at the Holiday Bible Club and 34 teens at Engage. And you'll see some of those activities up on the screen behind me. And there were a good number uh, of different uh, ladies involved at the, the, the Women's Bible Study uh, throughout the week upstairs. Our aim this week has been to make people aware that we are here and that we have something wonderful to share with them. The, that God's wonderful plan of salvation is available to everyone. And that was the purpose of us meeting. And it was great to be able to share the gospel with the young people and, and with the youths, and, but also with the many people that come into the cafe to share with them the love of the Lord Jesus and to share with them that they could have a living relationship with him. And we're really encouraged by the number of our older teens and the young adults who helped this year and really took on um, the whole a project as their own uh, and took great ownership over it. It's really tremendous to see that. It's our aim to continue to connect with those who we have met. Um, and neighborhood chaplains will be trying to um, reach out in different ways to connect with the people that we have contacted this week. Um, and if you're interested in being part of the neighborhood chaplains, uh, please speak to Michael McMillan um, over the next few weeks and let Michael know that you'd be interested in doing that. We had some uh, great uh, connections, and I had a couple that I just want to share because I think it'll encourage those of you who are involved in, in other ministries. So for instance, um, uh, I spoke to two, two gentlemen, two uh, Chinese gentlemen who were going to a conference um, up at Queens, one older and one younger, and the younger one told the older one, this is a church eight years ago when I studied here at Queen's that I used to come along to, to a thing called iCafe. So those of you who are involved in iCafe, he was amazed that it was still going and uh, it was still um, uh, keeping, keeping connection with international students. And they had, he, he was able to share what he learned for, at iCafe and how he had heard that there was a God who loved him. And, the other guy was from, he was actually Chinese, but he was living in Brisbane, and he shared how he too had encountered the gospel uh, while he was in Australia. And so we had a great chat about that. And then a few days previous to that, I met a German uh, lady and her husband, and she spoke good English, and he, he didn't speak such good English, which is interesting, because most Germans speak better English than I do German anyway, which is uh, not difficult. Um, but she was able to share that a few years ago she came here with her friends for a weekend and she was here at Easter and was invited in and, and found this a very welcoming and interesting place and how that she was telling her husband about it and she walked past the church and all these people were inviting her in for a tea and, and uh, some chat and they sat and chatted for quite a long time and had a good conversation about uh, the Lord Jesus and about the ability that he has to give us real life and real purpose. So I just thought we'd take the opportunity just to pray for uh, those folks who we encountered um, and just take the opportunity just to do that now before I hand over to you back to John. Yeah. Father, we thank you uh, for your love and for your care. And we thank you that you are interested in each one of us. We thank you that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to make it possible for us to have a living relationship with you. We thank you for the joy that we've had this week in sharing this good news with so many people here in the community around us. We pray, Father, that this will not be an isolated week, but, Lord, that we might truly be able to engage with the people around us. We might be able to share the love of the Lord Jesus with them and see them come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus as their Savior. We think of all the children who were here. We pray that you bless each one of them and the, what they heard might be precious to them and sink deep into their minds and their hearts and that they may come to know the Lord Jesus. We pray for their families too, and we pray that that might have an impact much wider and much greater um, than we can even imagine. So Lord, we look to you. We thank you that you're a great God, and we thank you that we can trust in you. We pray that you unite us as a church to be outward looking, to be reaching out into um, uh, all the, the highways and the byways and being able to share your love with so many different people from so many different communities and so many different backgrounds, and that you're 
um, word may continue to be a blessing um, to so many. So we commit uh, all of the activities of the week to you, and we ask that you guide and direct and create uh, divine appointments for us as we seek to continue to uh, connect with people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks very much, Robert. It's just really encouraging to hear about all those connections being, being made during the Community Week, which is great. Uh, we're going to continue our service then with the words of You Alone Can Rescue, which says, You alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, lead us out to death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. Uh, and during this song, our kids can head out to the Minor Hall for the, the Crescent Kids uh, Summer Program. So we'll stand and sing, You Alone Can Rescue. Before Danny comes to speak to us, uh, we have a, a number of announcements uh, which uh, should appear on the screen. So the first and most important announcement is there is no evening service tonight, so no evening service. Instead, we've got the Crescent Church Family Walk, which is happening at Sir Thomas and Lady Dixon Park. And please do note the change of time. So it is starting at 6.30 rather than 4.30. So 6.30 tonight. Uh, we're trying to find that perfect weather window, which as you know in Northern Ireland is a hard thing to do. So uh, please also come prepared for any weather. Uh, it being an ordinary summer. Um, also, there will be a minibus leaving the church from 6.15. So you can either come here 6.15 and get the minibus, or you can go directly to Sir Thomas and Lady Dixon Park for 6.30. Uh, 
later on this week then, there will be a prayer meeting on Thursday at 8 p.m. Uh, where the focus will be on praying for Community Week. Um, and then next Sunday, Gareth Lewis will be continuing our series in First John and speaking to us on the topic of abiding with God. And next Sunday evening, Brooke Mullen will be speaking on the topic of knowing his voice as part of our series on the Good Shepherd. Uh, so just as a reminder then, tonight at 6.30 St. Thomas and Lady Dixon Park, or 6.15 here if you want to get the minibus. So I'm going to hand over to Danny now, who's going to talk to us. So it's my pleasure just to introduce Professor Danny Crooks, who is uh, well known to many of us, who's going to uh, continue our series in First John. Danny. Well, good morning. Um, thanks for coming along this morning. Um, if this is your first time uh, for a while, we'll give you a special welcome. We're in probably about two-thirds of the way uh, through our series on 1 John. And this morning, we have come to uh, chapter 4, and we're, our passage this morning is the first six verses of chapter 4. Let me just read the first six verses. Um, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is, ready, is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Now, uh, because we have only six verses to cover this morning, it's tempting just to take a little time uh, to stand back and to look at where our passage fits into the overall message of First John. So the purpose of First John, he states it as one of his main purposes towards the end of his letter. And he says in chapter 5, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So that you may know that you have eternal life. Now it's interesting to compare uh, this this purpose with the purposes, purpose of his earlier gospel, the Gospel of John. And near the end of his gospel, John states why he is writing it in chapter 20. These are written, he says, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In other words, John's gospel was written so that we would come to know how we can have eternal life. So how to have eternal life. But the letter, first letter was written so that you would know that you have it. So if you believe in Christ, as gospel says, you will have eternal life. But if you're not sure whether or not you have it, well, that's why his letter was written. The message that it is possible for humans to have eternal life, for us to have the very life of God himself, it's so radical that sometimes believers can doubt if they have the real thing. So what evidence should we look for if we, if we have believed in Jesus? <clears throat> what evidence should we look for if we want to be sure that we have eternal life? Well, John has based his letter on three things which were revealed or were manifested and which John himself personally saw and heard as he worked with 
walked with Jesus. So in 1 John, there are five chapters, and John highlights three things that were uniquely revealed in Jesus. In the first two chapters, we've already seen that uh, the life of God was revealed, that Jesus was the embodiment of the life of God, but more than that, so that Jesus came so that we could have that same life of God in us. So the life of God was revealed in Christ and also in us. Then, starting at chapter 3 and going up to the end of our passage this morning, there's something else is revealed. And in this section, John talks a lot about uh, children of God. And I'm going to uh, describe what it was revealed, uh, perhaps rather controversially, as the DNA of God. Now, uh, don't panic, but John does say in this section, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. Now, you might think my description of God's DNA, spiritual DNA, is a bit uh, radical. You'll search the scriptures and you'll never find any reference to DNA. But actually, it's more literal than you might think. As I mentioned, John talks about the seed, God's seed remains in them. Now, when a child is born, what does it share from its parents which remains in them all their life? Well, the child shares and inherits their parents' DNA. Now, in Bible times, they didn't use the term DNA, but they used the term seed to convey the same concept. A part of their parents which remains in them and abides in them for all their life. So this is more than just having fellowship with God, which is what the life of God enables us to have. But in this middle section, John says, you're actually children of God. You share God's DNA, and that produces family likeness. And in the third section of his letter, as we will see in times, uh, in weeks to come, uh, the love of God is revealed. And John will go into greater detail on how God's love can be revealed in our lives. Now, one interesting feature of the way John has structured his letter is at the end of each of those three sections, he slips in a little warning, a warning that there are counterfeits of what God offers in the gospel. For example, at the end of the first section, he talks about false Christs or antichrists. Even now, many antichrists have come, he says. Antichrists are false Christs, counterfeit Christs, people who claim to offer the same as what Jesus brought, but cannot deliver. And teachings, these are teachings which present a false picture of Christ. At the end of the second section, well, we read quite a lot about the spirit, the spirit, John says, of Antichrist. And false spirits are those which are in opposition to the spirit of truth. That's the Holy Spirit. So, a warning, first of all, against false Christs, then against false spirits, imitations of the Holy Spirit. And finally, the very last sentence in his, uh, his letter is a warning against false gods. He says, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. So we see that there are always dangerous teachings which try to present a false and deceitful version of each of the three persons of the Trinity. Now, with that in mind, you can see that our short passage this morning, uh, just those first six verses, uh, concentrates on John's warning against a false understanding of the Holy Spirit. Now, as, when you look at our passage, uh, if we just look at it again, I want to draw your attention to a small number of ideas which are repeated several times by John. So, in this uh, view of our passage, I've highlighted uh, references to the Spirit and to the spirits. There are eight references to, to that in just these six verses. John talks about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Antichrist, the Spirit of truth, and the Spirit of error. 
And we're told then to test the spirits. So what are these different spirits? We're not talking about ghosts or little devils around the place. John says that they reveal themselves by spreading ideas and by teaching. He says in this context, many false prophets have gone out into the world. You may have heard the phrase, the spirit of the age. Now, whatever that is, where does it come from? Who promotes it? Who spreads that idea? And you can get false prophets inside the church and outside the church. You can get religious false prophets. You can get secular false prophets. John says is a, that it's important and vital that we test each spirit, each popular idea that is transmitted to us. It might be from the secular world. It might be a new interpretation of scripture or a popular new movement in Christendom. It's important that we analyze where does this teaching come from? Is it from God or is it from somewhere else? And that brings us to two more ideas that John highlights through repetition. There's another word that has occurred very frequently, six times in fact, in this section. It's the phrase, the world. And we're not talking the geographical world, but the social world. And in particular, he talks about people who speak from the world. Now, compare that idea of the world and teaching that comes from the world with uh, another uh, repeated phrase, which is from God. Again, six times uh, he speaks about people from God or not from God. And if we put these two thoughts together, we can see what John is telling us to detect. To detect whether or not some new idea, some new movement, social movement, or in the church, or some new teaching, is it from God or is it from the world? And how do we tell whether a new idea is from God or whether it's a belief from this world inspired by a false spirit? Now, it's a good question. John tells us how God communicates his message to us, and this is one way we can trace the source of a new idea. In verse 6, he says, We are from God, referring to himself and the other apostles. Whoever knows God listens to us. And when John says we, as I say, he's referring to himself and the other apostles. Those apostles were given divine authority by the Lord Jesus to speak and to write the word of God. The New Testament is God's authoritative word on Christ. The scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. And the proper teaching of the scriptures, both New Testament and Old Testament, that is the only reliable and authoritative channel through which God communicates his truth to us today. So that's how we can tell if something is from God. Now, how do we tell if something is from the world? And this is a more complicated question. How does the world communicate its message? Well, I said the question was complicated. The question itself is simple, but the answer is a little more complex. So how do popular ideas spread through society in our world today? Who tries to persuade us to accept new beliefs? Let me give you a list of what I think are probably the most influential sources uh, right across the world telling us what we should believe. And let me say, first of all, when I mention these, I'm not going to criticize these uh, channels of communication, but we do just need to be aware of them and how they can sometimes be used. The first uh, channel, which I, I've called, if you like, the public media, which might include TV, news, newspapers, analysis, and debates, are all very valuable ways of informing us of how governments are thinking, of how the government, where the government wants us to move as a country. <clears throat> now, we in the UK are more fortunate than many countries <clears throat> uh, because our public media is both free on the one hand but yet regulated on the other. 
It's free to criticize or to promote certain ideas and beliefs, but it is supposed to be truthful and fair. And the BBC in particular is required to be balanced and unbiased. And that's a very good thing, and we should be grateful for that. So that's one channel through which we receive, if you like, new ideas, ideas that we are supposed to believe. Now, the next channel is what we call, might call social media. Now, this is unregulated, but it is very influential. And social media is almost the opposite of public media. Things like Facebook, Twitter, or X as it now is, YouTube, and other platforms are used by millions of people. And it's much less regulated. You can't believe what you read. It's not necessarily all wrong, but you just can't be sure. It doesn't have to be balanced. And there is much good and much interesting material available on social media. But as a source of promoting new ideas, you have to be very careful and sometimes very skeptical about believing what you hear and what you read on social media. The third channel that I'm just highlighting is the entertainment industry and the music industry. These sometimes promote popular ideologies. Now, the influence of the film industry is immense. And again, I'm not saying it's bad. There's much really good stuff uh, that you can watch. But we do need to be aware that the film and the music industries are increasingly being used to promote popular ideologies, particularly to young people. Now, I won't mention any in particular, uh, but I'll leave you to decide uh, which ones might be particularly relevant in promoting ideologies. So the entertainment industry and musical industry is very effective. It's a very effective way of preaching, if you like, and getting people to believe in the new spirit of the age. Now, just to be fair, I've highlighted universities and education. And I've mentioned particularly in the arts and humanities. So in subjects like science and engineering and medicine, uh, it is usually easier to find out if an idea is true or false. You can do experiments, you can test things, you can do measurements and calculations. But arts and humanities have to tackle more complex subjects where it's more difficult to nail down the truth. And if someone has a different opinion, it can be very difficult to disprove their belief. Now, most of the issues in arts and humanities are extremely helpful and uncontroversial. But the university sector has been a major driving force behind the promotion of more extreme ideologies, such as critical race theory and extreme ideas in gender studies. And finally, I should mention that another source of ideas is popular televangelists and faith healers, just a, an umbrella phrase, to show that these things come from Christian sources as well. And in Christian circles with satellite and cable TV and online broadcasting of services, some large churches and church networks have become very influential in promoting their own particular brand of ministry and of music. And slick professional presentation and broadcasting can make rather mundane content appear exciting and attractive. Again, there are many uh, excellent online sources of good Bible teaching, and I'm not knocking the medium as such, but you do have to be careful to examine what you're being asked to believe. Now, why I've chosen that is that there's th those five is that there's one thing which all these communication outlets have in common, in that each channel tries to appeal to the mass market, to appeal to as many people as possible. The truth is often unpopular and uncomfortable, and sometimes makes people uncomfortable. So it's not going to be acceptable to the mass market. And the message promoted by the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, does not appeal to the mass market. As John says in verse 6, Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. So if a new idea or a belief becomes popular across the globe, even among Christians, I don't mean to sound cynical, but the chances are 
that it is not from God. It's likely to be from the world. <clears throat> now, let me finish, uh, and don't get too excited about that, but let me finish by focusing specifically on teaching which is delivered in a church context. So not so much secular thoughts, but religious and even so-called Christian ideas. And we'll ask the question, how can we recognize if a new movement among churches in Christendom is from God? We've, the church has been subject to many new movements that have swept through churches. Some of you may not be old enough to remember the Toronto Blessing or uh, movements like that. And we've been encouraged <clears throat> to take these on board, adapt the way we operate as a church. We've been criticized as a church here even uh, for resisting the Holy Spirit because we haven't taken such ideas on board. <clears throat> but how can we recognize if a new movement through churches is from the Spirit of God? John gives us, uh, John is going to give us two tests. The first is this, what does the movement teach us about Christ? He says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. What does it mean that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? Why is that so critical? Well, and how is it relevant to being the child of God? Well, what John is saying here is that to recognize that Jesus is fully God and fully human. Remember that in the second section, John is talking about how the DNA of God has been revealed in Jesus and in us. In other words, he is saying that Jesus was not only God, but that his very nature was encoded in his spiritual DNA as well, not so much his physical DNA, but his spiritual DNA. In other words, it is possible to have the character, the nature of God revealed in a human being. That's who Jesus was. And the combination of the life and nature of God in human flesh is unique to Christianity. Now, in New Testament times, <clears throat> there were Greek philosophers who believed that our spiritual bodies were bad and they were limiting. The important thing was the spirit. And who, what you did with your body didn't really matter. The important thing was your spiritual nature and your spirit. And that, of course, left the door open to all sorts of immoral behavior because they said your, uh, your body doesn't matter. What you do with your body doesn't matter. They said the two, the spirit and the body, can't be combined. That who you are in your spirit is different from who you are in your body. In our modern world today, the common belief is almost the opposite of that. We're told that the physical world is all there is. There is no such thing as spiritual life. Your body and who you are as a person is all that matters. Now, both of these ideas are incompatible with the message that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and incompatible with the message that God's character and nature can be revealed in our bodies. And he has made it possible for us today to be children of God, to be born of God, to have God's spiritual DNA, making us a new person with a new father. Now, if in New Testament times you accepted the spirit of the age in the Greek world, or if today you accept the purely materialistic spirit of the age, which we're often taught, then you have no concept of being a child of God. You're denying a core principle of the gospel which Jesus manifested. Now, the second principle which John gives us about recognizing whether something comes from the Spirit of God, I'm going to cheat a little and I'm going to go back to his gospel 
where the Lord Jesus actually gave us a test to apply <coughs> to see whether or not something comes from the Holy Spirit. In the upper room ministry, uh, the Lord Jesus speaks about the Spirit of, of truth. And he says this, he shall not speak of himself, he shall glorify me. Now, this becomes relevant uh, when if you maybe go to a church or watch online a church where the message that you hear is all about the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, how we can experience the Holy Spirit in our lives. If you're watching a service like that, then you should be rather cautious. Now, let me give you an illustration. Northern Ireland has been privileged in recent years to have had visits from the United States of America president. We had President Clinton, we had President Obama, and more recently, President Biden. And they came to Northern Ireland to speak to the people of Northern Ireland. Now, imagine at the, the keynote address where the president is come to address the people of Northern Ireland. And the president is introduced by the chief local dignitary of Northern Ireland, whoever that might be. I'm not quite sure who that would be at the moment. But the local dignitary, uh, in introducing what's going to come, the climax of his speech goes something like this. Above all else, <clears throat> he says to the people of Northern Ireland, I would like to express my, our immense gratitude to the ambassador of the United States. The ambassador has worked day and night for months to arrange this visit. He's largely responsible for the event we have today. He's a most gifted and helpful person. We don't want his work to be overlooked. So put your hands together and let's hear it for the United States ambassador. And now I'd like to invite the president to come and address us. How do you think that introduction would go down? Either like a lead balloon or like a bombshell. The president would no doubt feel insulted. But if you were the American ambassador, how would you feel at that moment? You would be grieved and embarrassed. The last thing as an ambassador you would want to hear is to, take, to draw attention away from the president. If you were the ambassador, you would be ashamed for the president to think that you were interested in getting glory for yourself. And when a church meets together, the ambition of the Holy Spirit is to be Christ's ambassador. As the Lord said, he shall not speak of himself, he shall glorify me. And of all the teaching and the praise in the church focuses on Christ, the Holy Spirit will be pleased. That is his mission. And if all the attention is, in the, is on the Holy Spirit and his work, the Holy Spirit will be grieved and will be disappointed and even embarrassed. So if you have a friend who maybe uh, likes to go to services where all the mentions are of the Holy Spirit and his work, you might suggest that your friend go to the pastor of that church or to the elders of the church and say, perhaps for the next year, could all our teaching just be on the person of Christ? And at the end of that year, see if the church has grown. They may lose a few members, but to be honest, uh, the church itself would not suffer because of that. But the Holy Spirit wants the church to be fed through teaching about the Lord Jesus, who he is, his character, his mission, and his work. So that's the second test that John would encourage us to apply as to whether or not a movement is from the Spirit of God. I'll leave those two tests with you as John ends this section that you might apply in your own thinking to what you listen to, what you watch, where you go, where you receive your teaching to judge whether or not it is from the Holy Spirit. So let's close in a moment's prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have spoken. 
You have spoken authoritatively. You have given us the message, the gospel message, through the Lord Jesus. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit is active in our world today, promoting that gospel, promoting the message of the Lord Jesus. Father, if we are believers here this morning, we thank you that the Holy Spirit teaches us too, teaches us about Christ. And we pray that we might be sensitive to the spirit of truth. Help us to discern what is truth from what is error. And if anyone here is not a believer, we pray that they would open their hearts to the message of the Lord Jesus and to become through that a child of God, not merely religious or good living, but a fundamental change in their being to be a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, Danny. And to, to close our service this morning, we're going to stand and sing the words of, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Uh, the lyrics say, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, greatest treasure of my longing soul, my God, like you, there is no other. True delight is found in you alone. So we'll stand and sing, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, and then our service will be over. Thank you. Thank you.